All right, a big pile of rocks. What I'm looking for here is uh, evidence of differential weathering, differences in, in uh, the weathering in the rocks based on, on the minerals um, and their, their resistance to weathering. Now, this is a big, this is a boulder here, um, and you can see it consists of some striations. Uh, this is a metamorphic rock, and so probably what you had here is there were sediment, layers of sediment that were, were laid down at one time, and they were, um, they were buried deeply, and they were heated and put under pressure and, uh, and transformed into other minerals even. So it's not only the grains, that some of the grains of the sediment, of say the sandstone or siltstone or... In this case, it was probably uh, silt and clay. The grains got remelted. Even um, that's one of the keys with with metamorphism, is remelting, and so remelting, recrystallization, um, and that's what we get. We get these kind of uh, layers, oftentimes. But you can see here that there's that it's not smooth on the surface of this rock. You can see where some minerals have uh, really dissolved away. Um, I'm looking particularly at this hole right here. There must have been a more weatherable mineral there, maybe um, like olivine or, uh, or something like that, a more, a more weatherable mineral that actually uh, dissolved right there. Now, one of the interesting things is that um, the, the idea of mineral stability is closely related to equilibrium. I mean, all of these things, um, all these minerals are really not at equilibrium with the current um, environment. They were formed in a very high temperature, high pressure environment. So they're all destined to uh, to dissolve at some point, uh, exposed to the weather at the surface of the earth like this. But some will do it more, more quickly than others. And so there we've got a divot. Now picture this. So this, this kind of thing here where we've got um, basically an uneven surface that has developed as a result of differences in in resistance to weathering. Picture this on a landscape scale. So picture this boulder as the earth. And uh, what would happen then is you'd have, you could have actually have ridges and valleys developing along the lines of the natural structure of the rock, which is what we've got here. Um, and what that, what that leads to in on a landscape scale is something we called uh, structure controlled landforms or a structure controlled landscape. Uh, right in back here I have another exa good example of uh, some differential weathering. You can see these, well, hopefully you can see. There's some quartz crystals, there's a layer of quartz crystals in here and you can even see the, the crystals have been uh, exposed because something that was around them has been uh, dissolved out, or at least that's what it appears. If you look, uh, I can actually pop some of these out of here. So that, again, is uh, a good example of uh, differential weathering. Let's see what else I can find. This pile of rock, by the way, um, is what's left over after they... Uh, they got some of what they wanted out of here. This is a, a gravel bank that is in a glacial fluvial deposit. They've all but removed what was an esker over here, and you can see the remains of uh, one of the ends of the esker over here. They're cutting into it, and they've all but removed that now. Um, what, I, what I was kind of hoping to find was, was a really highly weathered rock, and it looks like I'm not going to find that. One of the things that's cool about, um, oh, here we go. Here's a good example. This is, uh, you can see this is, is what we would call uh, saprolite or rotten rock. And this is a rock that, that has a lot of minerals that are subject to weathering or else just had a structure uh, with a lot of kind of micro fractures in it or just the way it was, it was layered. It's more subject to weathering. And so you can see it's really weak. I can just, with this knife, kind of pick it apart in places. Um, and that's kind of what we would call, well, it's not really saprolite. Saprolite is when it's totally kind of broken into little pieces. But um, this, is, this is getting there. It's definitely subject to, uh, to a lot of physical breakdown. And that's, uh, that's kind of what I, was, what I was hoping to find here. But what I was just about to say was that the... Um, what you typically see in gravel banks like this, in, in glacial deposits, 
is a wide variety of different kinds of rocks. Um, here's one right here that's more of a granitic type of rock. Um, granitic nice. And uh, there is no way I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick away at that. It would take a, a carbide chisel to, uh, to really bite into that well and a hammer. Um, otherwise, I'm not going anywhere with that. So there's a lot of different types of rocks in here. Um, mostly metamorphic because that's what's in New England. And the glaciers came down uh, through from the north here. So they dragged with the mostly uh, metamorphic rocks. But I might find some igneous ones in here. Particularly some granite maybe that came from New Hampshire. Or uh, like the White Mountains. Here's a nice piece um, that, well, no, I guess this isn't a strict... Uh, granite, but um, it's got the color of it anyway. So anyway, you'll find some more, um, a pretty good variety of, of rocks in a place like this. Usually nothing terribly interesting, nothing you'd want to take home with you and uh, put on the shelf, but you never know. So um, just think about that. Think about how how the resistance, differences in resistance to weathering can cause patterns in the landscape. And as you're tooling around Google Earth, keep an eye out for that. Keep an eye out for, for example, linear types of forms or squarish, uh, rectangular, angular forms because you're not going to get those from just normal fluvial processes as we'll see. Water flowing in the landscape generally doesn't form uh, lines. It's generally going to create a, a, curve, a curved uh, type of pattern. All right, have fun.